Game week is on the horizon at Virginia Tech and UVA. The ACC has its policy in place for dealing with COVID outbreaks. The league moves into an alliance with the Big Ten and the Pac-12, and maybe Comcast moves closer to adding the ACC network to its channel line. All that, and what entrance song would you choose if you ran a college football program? This week on Teal and Barber. Welcome in to episode 55 of Teal and Barber, the Richmond Times-Dispatch and Richmond.com's Virginia Tech, UVA, and ACC sports podcast. I'm Mike Barber, ACC beat writer for the paper, and here with me as always, my co-host, the 13-time sports writer of the year and the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, David Teal. David, good to talk to you. Good morning, Mike. How are you? Things are things are excellent here. We had the first day of school this week for a uh, wow. kiddo. Yeah, so that was exciting to uh, hopefully get back to, to a normal school year. And um, I don't know if I've mentioned on the pod, but we live in the neighborhood with her elementary school. So um, we're able to walk her up and, nice. and the little guy comes with us too and the dog. So it's a, it's a nice family outing. And uh, she's still at the age where she appreciates that. I, I know as they get older, uh, she'll probably want to walk alone and won't want anything to do with mom and dad and maybe the dogs. The dogs will probably still be welcome. <laughs> but uh, it's funny. It got me thinking that I have I have so many wonderful memories from from my childhood and, and with my parents. And but I don't remember much about the first day of school. That for some reason doesn't resonate or stick. I'm curious for you, David. And uh, it was a few semesters ago, I, I imagine. But. <laughs> <laughs> when when we think about our first days of school, uh, anything come to mind? Well, now that you bring it up, it was a, a few semesters ago. And one thing that immediately pops to mind, and this isn't from kindergarten or elementary school. I remember in junior high, first day rolling in to Spanish class, Spanish one, and like a just like a brush fire through the door comes our teacher, Senora Brenner, and she's not speaking a word of English. <laughs> she is all into Spanish. She never spoke a word of English the entire class period. And I went home and told my parents, I'm failing Spanish one. <laughs> I assure you of that. And but thankfully, she came in the next day. <laughs> spoke a little English and I was able to grasp some things. Ended up taking three years of Spanish. But that first day was a little harrowing. Oh, I imagine. So Senor Brenner got the job done. What what was the final grade? I aced it. There you go. I I mean I'm sure she gets some of that credit too. Oh, she Uh, gets all of it. (laughs) It's funny when you say that it reminds me. I, I I just like I said, I don't remember, you know, the first day of kindergarten or elementary school, but I do remember my first day in, in my junior high school, it was in the middle of the day, and I was trying to find my classroom um, for my, my science class, and I went to where I thought it was, and I poked my head in the door, and there was this tiny little woman at the front of the room, and she was flexing her arms like a pro wrestler, <laughs> and she was saying, Mighty Mouse is a powerhouse, M for Mighty, M for Mitochondria. And I thought, oh my gosh, this woman's insane. Let me go back to finding my classroom. And uh, after walking the halls back and forth, I, I ran into somebody who showed me the classroom and it was the classroom with this woman, Miss Connolly. Uh, and she was my science teacher. And uh, you know, she asked me why I was late and I didn't want to explain that I had actually been almost on time, but was just terrified by her her front of the class flexing but you know in terms of being a great teacher hey how many years later and i still remember remember that so uh that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell so uh it's funny what you remember what you don't and and what uh what impacts you now how about tiny teal Has, has school started for you guys already no we're we're more traditional here it's day after labor day so you've got a little more time to enjoy summer. Is she uh, is she old enough to have that sense of uh, urgency to enjoy the last days of summer? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, she and Joe went to Bush Gardens yesterday, nice. and uh, we'll we'll probably tr- try to make a family outing back there uh, at at some point. 
Uh, she, she may have uh, hopped on a ride one too many times yesterday and <laughs> upset that tummy a little bit, no. but uh, uh, she'll, she'll be eager to go back, I assure you. Well, this sounds like something that maybe we need to get the, the two families together. My wife loves roller coasters and rides. My daughter loves roller coasters and rides. And I just, it's not for me. Yeah. And I, I hate the rush and the speed and the, the dips and the spins. And uh, I, I can't do any of it. So I keep saying, you know, we'll go and, and Elizabeth and, and Amelia can ride the rides. And maybe Evan and I will kind of stand there and take some pictures. But uh, maybe if we make it a group outing, it'll, it'll be a little more fun with some more people who are into riding those rides. Strength in numbers. There you go. Now, while they were at Bush Gardens for part <laughs> of your day yesterday, uh, you were on a, a teleconference, a Zoom conference with uh, three league commissioners. I was on there as well, uh, announcing, I guess officially, although there, there's nothing official to it, uh, announcing an agreement that, w- that we're calling the alliance between the ACC the Big Ten, and the Pac-12. And they basically gave a a loose outline of what is essentially, David, a gentleman's agreement to work together to do things that are in the best interest of the student-athlete, which nobody can argue with that goal. I I think we might have some questions about uh, the loose construct. But David, give me your big uh, bullet point. You know, they put out bullet points, the ACC did in a press release. What were David Teal's bullet points? What did you take away from, from what we learned? Well, the the lack of details, Mike, was hardly surprising. I mean, they they've only been discussing this conceptually since late July, when the news broke that Texas and Oklahoma were bolting the Big Twelve for the SEC. None of this happens if that doesn't. It it, it was clearly cause and effect. So that that's number one. Number two, I was very struck by the three commissioners' response to the inevitable college football playoff expansion question. Jim Phillips from the ACC saying, we haven't made a decision. George Klyovkov of the Pac-12 saying 100% behind expansion, but there are issues on the margin. Kevin Warren also saying all in on expansion, but we think we should do our due diligence and some more homework. Absent from All those remarks was an endorsement of the 12-team model that the CFP working group came up with without the input of these three commissioners, by the way, and which the presidents who run the CFP will consider on September 28th. So that that was a a, a primary part of this. And then the other one was the the scheduling component, where they, they were very direct in saying... They don't intend to interfere with pre-existing future schedules. So Virginia Tech's still going to play Alabama, you would think, as as contracted. Virginia's still going to have its series against, say, Kansas that that, that it has on the books. Clemson's still going to play LSU. So that got me to thinking, okay, you're going to be playing all these games plus the Alliance are we moving toward an era where it's just power five against power five and that's it? And George Klyovkov, when I asked the question yesterday, just essentially blew me out of the water and <laughs> said, no, there's there, there's no intention of that. And we're going to encourage our, our members to schedule games against uh, a group of five or even FCS conferences. So I'm sorry to ramble, but there there were a lot of takeaways yesterday. Yeah, it it was, I mean, it was sort of a sprawling uh, concept without a lot of specifics. The thing that I'm curious about, David, and and you you have such good insight into this, you think about these three conferences and and it's kind of like we were talking about going to Bush Gardens, their strength in numbers. (laughs) So you you get together and now um, if you view the SEC and ESPN as sort of the evil empire. Well, now you've added some strength here to the rebellion, but where does the ACC fit? Because the ACC network is in ESPN partnership. How do they navigate what, what looks to me to be a very tricky little pass there between the two? Yeah. Well, the ACC, you know, all its media rights belong to ESPN. Mm-hmm. Now ESPN in turn sells off some games to regional sports networks, but not many. So the ACC and ESPN have long been joined in the hip, at the hip and long will because that contract goes until 2035-36. Right. 
Now, I don't think ESPN can blame the ACC if in the course of doing business and wanting to bump its own revenue and in turn everyone's revenue, that the ACC is part of an alliance. And I think this is part of the alliance's play now is to, even if the three leagues decide, hey, let's go all in on expansion, maybe even this this 12-team model, let's not do it right away when ESPN would have exclusive renegotiation rights. Let's wait until the expiration of the original 12-year contract. So the CFP began in 2014. That would take us through the 2025 season. And let's take it to market and get multiple networks bidding on this, ratchet up the, the rights, and maybe even like the NFL does, divvy it up. You know, one year CBS does the Super Bowl. The next year NBC does the Super Bowl. The next year it's Fox. Maybe that's the way it plays out with the CFP championship game. Maybe that's the way it plays out for the the semifinals. I don't think ESPN could fault the ACC for wanting to do what's best for its bottom line. I don't think they could fault them, but they still have for the next five years a Mm -hmm. a pretty important sway. Oh, yeah. um, and really beyond that, probably for the next 15. So my question is, couldn't ESPN bring to bear pressure on the ACC to say, hey, this is what we want. You side with us, not with your alliance. And and as we've was mentioned repeatedly on this Zoom, there is no formal contract. There is no legal agreement to, to vote together as a block on issues or anything like that. Um, it just seems to me that the ACC is in a precarious spot where uh, the Big Ten and Pac-12 are going to want to pull them one way and probably the way that the ACC wants to go. But ESPN is going to put considerable pressure to go another direction. I think I think it certainly could, and clearly the SEC would 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 be in, in ESPN's corner here. The, the The curious part then is what of the group of five conferences, and that's that's you know that's five of eleven votes here. Are they in a hurry to expand the playoff so they can? essentially have a seat at the table because under the, the current, the proposed model with six automatic bids, the group of five is going to have at least one team in the playoff every year. It's highest rated champion, maybe even two. So do they want to wait that long just because the media rights are going to be larger in, in the end game? Or are they impatient and want their playoff game now? Right. It's, and it's, it's, it's a very interesting calculation. It certainly is. And at the end of the day, like all things off the field, it comes down to money. And that's where I wonder, I mean, ESPN could very easily throw them a group of five game of the week TV deal um, to say, okay, here, here's, here's some extra to sweeten the pot. Um, it, it just seems like even with this alliance, <laughs> I, I make the ESPN SEC combination a heavy favorite <laughs> if, if the interests are not the same, right? If the alliance is going one way and ESPN SEC is going the other, I mean, to me, ESPN SEC is the death star and, and, and I know how the movies ended, but uh, that was a little bit of fantasy long shot here. I, I just I think that's going to be hard to overcome. And um, but what are some good things, David? Beyond you know what we're talking about here with the TV. When I heard the alliance, the first thing I thought was, hey, maybe they're going to streamline name image likeness. Hey, maybe they're going to streamline COVID policies. Maybe there's going to be a sense of. Um, kind of bringing together, you've talked about this so many times and written about the idea that college football lacks uh, central leadership. Mm -hmm. Maybe these three conferences were going to have that. I didn't come away. Now, I didn't get to ask that question, but I didn't come away with a sense like we're moving in that direction with these three conferences. No, I I don't think so. Certainly not from a, from a COVID policy. And I know we'll, we'll talk more later about the, the ACC's protocols for the, the, the upcoming fall season well, actually ongoing now that the, the, the soccer seasons have, have, have started. But I, I think it's more in line with as we approach this constitution committee of which Jim Phillips is the ACC's representative and future governance with you know, is the NCAA going to be in charge or is it going to be 
the, the, the conferences themselves, you know, so many balls up in the air. But what, what, is, what is clear from yesterday, at least to me, was is that these three, the, the ACC, Big Ten, and Pac-12, remain very committed, staunchly committed to what they call the collegiate model. And in so saying, they have inferred very clearly that the SEC is not wedded to that model and might prefer a more direct pay-for-play uh, system. So when you when you look at it, were you struck because as you mentioned at the start, you know this comes from <clears throat> the SEC raiding a couple of big time programs, right, uh, in Oklahoma and Texas. Were you struck by the fact that there is no signed legal agreement, that there is nothing that says we're in this agreement, here it is on paper, and we're not going to take schools from each other, and we're not going to do any of those things that that damage each other. Um, it was very, you know, wonderful and, and touchy feely when they were all saying, you know, we looked into each other's eyes and made this <laughs> deal. David, do you buy it? Not quite, man. And 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 here's the reason. Mike, these dudes don't hardly know one another. I, uh, Jim Phillips six months ago and Kevin Warren also, they couldn't have spelled Klyovkov. I mean <laughs> they, to be fair, I still can't. Well, <laughs> They didn't know him. He didn't know them. Sure, Kevin Warren and and Jim Phillips worked together for, what, a year in the Big Ten before Phillips left the Northwestern AD gig to to become ACC commissioner. But it's this was a whirlwind courtship of essentially five weeks. And you would think you'd need a prenup, but... (laughs) There's, there's no prenup here. So I, I think it's very fair to wonder if at the first hint of a roadblock or of conflict, if all this falls apart and everybody forgets that we ever had yesterday's Zoom. Yeah. I, I mean, it sent me scurrying to the betting sites to see if there were any prop bets on <laughs> which conference first breaks the alliance. It, it just, and it goes back to something I remember you talking about being at ACC media days when they had that banquet, right? Right. John Swafford and who was in the room right before the Texas and Oklahoma news breaks, who's rubbing elbows, sharing cocktails and, and apps or whatever wonderful spread they had. I wasn't on the guest list for that. Nor, uh, nor was I. Right. Greg Sankey, the SEC yes. commissioner, is in the room, and this is the, the bond of trust in college athletics. He doesn't mention any of this, no. right? Like I would have loved to have had you know a mentalist standing there studying his eyes and his body language, and you know what, what was he thinking knowing the secret that he's holding on to that is about to just – blow up everybody's world and then a few weeks later to hear these guys come out and say well we we trust each other what is that based on yeah no the 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 acc was literally in peril back in 2013 before the 15 schools got together and did what signed a contract (laughs) called a media or a grant of media rights that essentially binds them all together. It was in writing. That's why the ACC feels secure in its membership. So I thought it was a very interesting question. It was first posed by Dan Wolken of, of USA Today to the three commissioners yesterday. And then Bruce Feldman from The Athletic followed up and it, it at both turns, you know, the, the commissioners, you know, this is all about trust. And Jim Phillips said, you know, if we've gotten to the point where we have to have a contract, we've lost our way. Well, <laughs> I think we can argue that that's exactly why they were having the press conference, right? Yeah. College athletics has lost its way. Um, it, it sounds noble and it sounds wonderful. And I think it was Kevin Warren who said that he had a, a law school professor who had said, you know, if you need to go back and read the fine print on a contract right. that you've entered into, you've probably mm-hmm. entered into a contract with the wrong person. That sounds wonderful. It really does. It's how we want things to be. It's just, it just doesn't seem like reality. And um, the fact that 
neither of the men on either time when they were asked addressed the question of would one conference take a school from another conference? Right. To me, they left that door wide open because they know damn well that if it comes down to it, uh, they're going to grab each other's schools uh, if it's if they feel like, hey, it's a matter of survival. And um, to your point, sign a document. Hey, it's not like they said, we wanted to announce this. We feel really good about this. We're finishing the contract. Right. It's not like when when you announce that your defensive coordinator is getting an extension and he hasn't signed it yet. Right. The deal's not done yet. It's it's coming. Um, it's not like they said, yeah, we've got a document we're going to be signing in the next couple of weeks, but we wanted to shout it from the mountaintops that we trust each other. They were like, no, we're not signing anything. Uh, it, it just it, it feels like they've built themselves a, a paper tiger to, to face what is a, a very real tiger in, in, in the SEC. Well, and it, it, it's interesting Mike, that 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 you mentioned, kind of the the, the timing of, of everything. I don't think there would have been any announcement or press conference yesterday if all this hadn't started to leak about a week ago when Max Olson of the Athletic first had the news about this conceptual alliance. Uh, I I know some people in ACC circles who were pretty steamed that it leaked because I think they would have really preferred to have more detail ready to go when they announce this. Yeah. And that makes sense. But it just, again, it, it just seems odd that the answer to the question was, we don't need a signed document as opposed to, we don't yet have a signed document, but um, you know, it is, it is a fascinating twist in, in this saga <laughs> that we're going to be following all year. And and um, I think it's going to be, I don't know, I hate to say distraction, but it's going to loom over everything because really though, what we want to talk about is what's on the field. And we're getting, we're getting close to that. And um, I'm not saying that yesterday took away from that, but um, it just seems like there's so many of these issues outside the game. Boy, it's going to be really fun when we can focus in on, on the games. Yeah, I, I I agree 100%. Uh, one thing uh, interesting that that eventually came out yesterday after the Zoom mic is, you know, they they mentioned this group of 11 athletic directors from the three conferences who are serving on a working group to examine the the, the scheduling options. And among those 11 athletic directors is UVA's Carla Williams. So it'll be be interesting to see what uh, insight, if any, she, she, she will offer uh, to, to we scribes uh, here in, in, in the coming weeks about that process. Because, you know, one of the, the cool components of this would be more intersectional games among the three conferences, right. especially the ACC and Pac-12, who rarely in the regular right. season meet. Uh, I, I went back and crunched the numbers from the last 10 seasons – the ACC has, of its 503 non-conference games, 10 were against the Pac-12. Well, that's fascinating because how many of those were, I remember Virginia, Oregon, Virginia, UCLA, and Virginia, USC, right? Well, for, uh, in, in the last 10 years, Virginia played four of those 10. Wow. The, the, the USC series was more than 10 years ago. Gotcha. Um, that's interesting, though, I, I, that that they had such a a large share of, of yes. a pretty small, pretty small thank, number. Thank there. you, John Oliver. Right. I was going to say there was a a western swing of scheduling there for a while. Uh, David, while we're talking about the ACC um, and the upcoming season, they've announced their their COVID protocols and much like Bronco Mendenhall has been advocating since last year, uh, teams that can't field a team because of the virus are going to forfeit that week, that game. Uh, David, are you surprised? And is this the right way to go? No, not surprised. Yes, right way to go. The interesting thing t to me, Mike, is that while every other conference that has announced a, a, a protocol for this you know, has, has gone along with, with what the ACC did, saying if, if, if one team is unable to play, it will be assessed a loss in the conference standings. The other team will, be, will receive a win. Where the ACC differs from everyone else, and I have seen no other league do this, if both teams have virus issues, the ACC is docking both teams. 
they both get L's. Whereas in the other leagues, if neither team can play, it's just a no contest and nobody gets a W or an L. And and I think that's fascinating. Right. I, I think it's smart, and I think it, that's that's a much fairer ending to me, because think about it this way. If you have a COVID outbreak, you're hit with a loss, essentially, right? If you had a COVID outbreak, you can't play, you're hit with a loss. Why do you get a pass if it happens that your outbreak <laughs> comes the same week as your opponent's, right. and somebody else, they haven't done anything worse or better than you, but mm-hmm. their outbreak comes on a week when you know it, your opponent has the same. It just to me that made no sense. It was if you can't get your team to the field, you take an L. And, and the idea that it could be somehow canceled out by something beyond your control or, or not taken off because of something beyond your control that seems unfair. So to me, this seems like a more equitable way to um, I don't, I don't want to say punish because that sounds like the wrong word, but to um, really, I guess, uh, rule on games that are, are taken out by the virus. Could be the first time in in the, the history of sports that the wins and the losses don't add up to the same number in the conference standing. And, and, <laughs> and, and you talk about coastal chaos now, dude. If there are double forfeits involved and then tiebreakers – it it's gonna make your your eyeballs bleed. Yeah, I, I believe it. It's funny that you say that because the the first thing I thought of was my my first job in Virginia at the at the Daily News Record, and one of my jobs was when we updated the CAA and ACC standings to add up the wins and losses to make sure they were equal yep. because there's no reason for them not to be. So my thoughts and prayers with whoever has my old job in, in Harrisonburg, because there's a chance that the column on the left isn't going to equal the column on the right uh, this crazy? college football season. Yeah. Uh, like everything else, something else fun and crazy with the ACC. People have been clamoring, talking about, Hey, why isn't the ACC network on Comcast? Why are Comcast mm-hmm. subscribers which is a huge part of the market here in Virginia, shut out from the ACC network. Well, very briefly, David, <laughs> uh, they all got their wish. They, they got ACC network, but it turns out that wasn't anything to get too excited about, was it? No, it was a, it was a technical glitch out of, out of Bristol. And the way it's been explained to me was that in preparation for Hurricane Henri, the, the folks at ESPN were doing some kind of uh, system switch and somebody mistakenly <laughs> put the ACC network. I don't know how these things work. I'm not an engineer, but all of a sudden the, the network appeared on Comcast. And of course, you knew if in this social media age that somebody would spot it and sure enough they did and it it blew up on on twitter that night but uh it has since been uh rectified uh in bristol but as as we have discussed and we have both written it's coming and it will probably be in in about a month late september that's when disney's current contract with Comcast, its carriage agreement expires, and the new one, in almost all certainty, will uh, will include the ACC network, and that that will Mike essentially complete the circle for mm-hmm. the ACC network. They will be on all the major television providers, and Comcast is a largest. It's, it's got it's got about twenty million subscribers yep. nationwide. And like I said, a huge chunk of here in Virginia. So a lot of people missing UVA and, and tech games. Uh, and a lot of people uh, like me changing uh, their provider. I, I switched over to Hulu uh, because I couldn't you know, wait anymore <laughs> uh, to, to get games, especially in the pandemic year where we weren't always in the stadium. Um, I do predict that when they get this deal done, uh, the ACC network will find something uh, more attractive than the, what was it, 1,300, the four-digit channel number. I, I'm guessing yes. they'll... they'll <laughs> have it a little yes. more uh, closely packed to the rest of the sports channel lineup. But, um, you know, it makes me think of the, the movie, The Office, and uh, they fixed the glitch. So uh, it, it's not there, but like you said, we believe it's coming. And when it comes, you'll be able to watch UVA, Virginia Tech, and, you know, those teams are, are in getting into game mode now, right? We're, we're really two weeks out, and, and they're starting to put in uh, – 
scout stuff from the opponents. They're opening opponents. Virginia Tech has UNC, obviously, in a, in a really marquee matchup. UVA eases into things a little more with, with <laughs> William and Mary. Uh, let's talk. start with the Hokies. Let's start in Blacksburg. And, and David, I'm looking at an offense that has a chance to be really versatile. Um, when you think about Braxton Burmeister at quarterback and his athleticism, which you've written about, his mobility, the things he can do uh, to keep a play alive, to, to make plays with his legs, but also to keep passing plays alive by, by scrambling around. Raheem Blackshear, we've, we've talked and, and written about his versatility, his ability to play receiver or running back and, and do different things. And then James Mitchell, the tight end. Uh, who is able to to play like a wide receiver, to block like a true tight end, to line up like an H-back. It just seems like this offense has a lot of chess pieces that move around more like a queen than a pawn. They, they got a lot of options here. I think you're right. And I think it will also help them that they, they appear at, at least – uh, if if you listen to the coaching staff, they appear to like what they have up front, and they think they're versatile and deep there a, a, as well. And I, I was I've also been struck that you know Justin Fuente th- seems to think that they can carve out a niche for Connor Blumrick. You know the the the, the, the transfer who you know has got you, you see him on the practice field and he stands out because he's just bigger <laughs> than all the rest of the. Yeah, it's a quarterback now. He's six five, and I'm interested to see how they they, they might use him. Now, Justin Fuente said yesterday when I asked him about it that maybe not the first game, although that might be coy too. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm curious to see what Blumrick's versatility um, holds for this offense. Yeah, I, you know, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago, I think it was now, but um, this isn't going to be one of those offensive game plans where you hold anything back <laughs> uh, no. for later in the year where you go vanilla. Uh, they need all hands on deck. And you're right, there, there, there are so many fascinating pieces. And I asked Brad Cornelson and Justin Fuente this uh, this week. We're seeing it used to be that if a team had one guy who could do all these things, that was a big story, right? We would do a feature on them and it would be talked about on TV broadcast. And now it seems like a lot of programs have two, three, four guys who are these versatile pieces. And, you know, the coaches gave some different reasons why. Justin Fuente pointing to seven on seven and and how that's expanded uh, the skill set of guys before they get uh, to college football. Brad Cornelson talking about really the trickle-down effect of the spread offense and and having more space. And suddenly you want more guys on the field who can do something with that space. Uh, To me, it's one of the transformative changes in college football. Well, and you, you see it at, at UVA as well, most uh, most particularly with Keaton Thompson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, a guy who can do everything, right? Came to UVA as a quarterback, but uh, figures to be this year, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but a, a key part of their receiving core. David, how about the other side of the ball, the defense and um the news just keeps being bad at the defensive end position. They, they look very thin there. Um, they sound a little more confident about that second cornerback spot, which I think for everybody was a big question going into camp. You knew Jermaine Waller on one side has all American potential. Uh, then you got a, a cast of guys on the other side and you need somebody else to step up, whether it's Dorian Strong, whether it's Armani Chapman, whether it's Breon Murray, uh, even Nadir Thompson has been mentioned a few times. So first, let's start there. How do we feel about the corner who isn't named Jermaine Waller? I think they're going to be good. I, I you know, st- Strong to me got ushered into c- to college football, per- perhaps in, in not the way that you would have would have liked uh, during during the pandemic and and out of necessity. But I think he learned and 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 showed uh, real flashes. And the the coaches have raved about Chapman this this fall now, or this mm-hmm. summer. Uh, they they really like the, the the camp that that he has had. I think the Hokies are going to be strong uh, at, at corner. And you, you mentioned defensive end, where clearly they are thin. But boy, everyone's saying that Taiwan Garbett is mm-hmm. quote unquote back, and that would be a big deal for this team, especially with the Emmanuel Belmar news. Yeah, I know I've been saying this over and over, but I like 
Virginia Tech's first 11. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Barno and Garbett at end, that to me sounds like a fantastic duo of defensive ends getting after the quarterback. Now, no depth behind them, big concern, but it's interesting those two positions because to me, they're the key to the opener, right? Because you're facing Sam Howell. You're facing this quarterback who has the ability uh, to dissect defenses, uh, to diagnose what you're trying to do to him, to find the open man. Um, I had somebody tell me this week, he can throw receivers open. You know, it just they've got new receivers. They're breaking in, not as experienced, not as maybe explosive as they've been in the past. But Sam Howell elevates that group. And well, what are the two positions you need to, to combat Sam Howell? One, you need defensive ends to get after him to disrupt his timing, to get him uh, in a hand in his face, those kind of things. And then you need corners to make sure that he doesn't have uh, avenues to throw the ball out to those receivers. And it's interesting that those are the two positions we're talking about, whether we're happy or sad about uh, how they are right now at Virginia Tech. Those two positions, to me, are going to be vital in the open. No question. And someone else that that I'm fascinated by this season at at, at Virginia Tech in the secondary, I'm going to post a column about him here in, Mm -hmm. in the next couple of hours, and that's Devin Hunter. And he is the he's the highest rated high school recruit that Virginia Tech has signed since Kendall Fuller. Back in, in, in 2013, much documented legal problems kept him away from the program in, in 2020. You and I have both talked at length with Justin Fuente about the decision to reinstate him after his felony charge was pleaded down to, to a misdemeanor. So uh, t- to me, you know, this is Hunter's fourth year in the program. And there are there are several college football teams, you know, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State. They can whiff on their top ranked recruit in a class. Virginia Tech is not one of those programs, and they really need Hunter to play and play well, especially with Devin Taylor now going in in the transfer portal. Maybe his transfer is a sign that Hunter was clearly the best and w- yeah. was going to win the job. But either way, he needs to perform not only on the field and have his personal house in order, but also on the field. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you bring up such a great point with Devin Taylor, who a lot of people have been picking as maybe a, a breakout player this year. Um, I've been saying reserve judgment on him going in the transfer portal, because if it turns out that Devin Hunter is ready to fulfill his potential, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, if not, then then yeah, it's another question and a red flag. But yeah, those are all going to be key guys uh, for this this opening matchup, a huge matchup with Carolina. Certainly, we'll get more into that next week. But I wrote a little bit about how the Tar Heels have been preparing for their trip to Lane Stadium <laughs> by, by blasting Enter Sandman during practice, right? So since uh, 2000, Virginia Tech has used uh, Metallica's heavy metal ballad to, to come out on the field, the student section. They jump, the whole stadium now jumps. It it often registers on the Richter scale. Uh, it is a spectacle and a great entrance. And uh, UNC's coaches, Dre Bly, uh, the former NFL corner, Stacy Searles, the offensive line coach who's uh, been at Virginia Tech on staff, uh, they talked about you know getting their team ready so it's not surprising, so it doesn't overwhelm you. And it, it got me thinking about this week's edition of Who You Got. Thank you, Mike. This is going to be a great one. Uh, you ask any Virginia Tech fan, and they'll tell you that Enter Sandman is the best song, the best song for a college football team to take the field to. Now, if we take that one away, uh, what song would you want to hear as you charge onto the field? Let's start with David. I am going to go to our uh, shared roots, Mike, in, in New Jersey. Uh, I remember this so well from George Mason's 2006 Final Four run because the Patriots adopted this song. I'm going with John Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. Oh, that is good. (laughs) Uh, That's a good one, Mike. Those are really good. So the first thing that came to my mind was Crazy Train by Ozzy Osbourne. I think because our high school wrestling team used to come out to that. Uh, But I don't know. I think for me to make it more personal, I need to go with something 
from the who. And, and I thought, Dean, you might be able to weigh in. What would I go with if I want to go with something from the who's catalog? I think as the other team comes out, I'd play Who Are You? <laughs> That's very good. I like that. Yes. The one I was thinking was Won't Get Fooled Again. I love when Roger Daltrey screams after the keyboard solo and comes back in with uh, Keith Moon's drums. That would probably be me charging yeah. onto the field to the end of uh, Won't Get Fooled Again. Yeah, that would get me ready to play. That That's the part I was I was kind of picturing when I thought that. I, I think we're ready. I think guys were ready to run some college football programs, or at least <laughs> the game day entrance aspect of, of it. Maybe not the rest, as we've talked about. There are a lot of issues in college football that maybe we would uh, not be as quick to want to tackle. Uh, speaking of tackling, let's talk about Virginia. Let's talk about defense first. And let's talk about, David, a secondary that was not very good a year ago. They've brought in some pieces to address that. Josh Hayes, though, the corner from North Dakota State, he's been out with an injury. They're hoping he'll be back for the opener, uh, but certainly that that's delayed his uh, immersion into the program. Um, Anthony Johnson, the transfer from Louisville, really rave reports on, on how he's uh, yeah. performed so far, how he's fit in personality and performance. Uh, some of the players who are coming back, David, I think are pretty decent players. Uh, Joey Blunt, who obviously dealt with injuries, I think he's a good player. Nick Grant, a lot of experience now at that corner spot. So what do we make of UVA's secondary issues last year? And do we think that's going to be a thing of the past? Can they stay healthy? <laughs> I don't I mean, know. That's a great question. I'm, 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 I'm really not, I'm not trying to be glib because that, that's been the issue for, for the Cavaliers. And if they can stay healthy and keep poor Devontae Cross at one position, right? And just <laughs> let him play safety and 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 not have to to, to move him around. I mean, I think Blunt and Cross, that's pretty good safety tandem, no? Yeah, it certainly looks that way. And and to me, the talent doesn't match the numbers. And 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 last year, you know, got sideways for so many reasons. But it's interesting that you mentioned Cross. You know, I I was talking to him after a practice, and and I said, you know, now that you've been at UVA for so long, so many years, uh, does the media stuff get easier? And do you start to enjoy it? Because he was laughing and joking around with me. And and earlier in his career, he wasn't very outspoken. And sometimes it takes guys a little while to blossom in that area. And he said, you know, yeah, it is easier. You're more comfortable. But he said, so he said, you guys spent my first three years just asking me the same question over and over. What does it feel like to move positions again? He said, I felt like I gave you a good answer the first time. And I just wanted to tell you to go back and use that again. And I just kept getting <laughs> the same question. So the poor guy has been um, asked to learn and do a lot, um, not just defense, but he's been at wide receiver. He's been at quarterback. He's been at corner. He's been at safety. They've used him some in, in nickel type packages. Uh, I think, yes, yeah, settled into a home uh, with him there. If Blunt stays healthy, uh, some combination of Johnson uh, and Hayes uh, at corner uh, you know, with Nick Grant, and then we're forgetting Darius Bratton. Darius Bratton. Who's coming again off injury and injury and injury. But yep. Darius Bratton in the spring, Bronco Mendenhall said he's the closest thing they had to a shutdown cover corner. There you uh, go. So there are pieces there. It's kind of like we talked about at Virginia Tech. Just because we don't have a clear starter doesn't mean they don't have some good players there. So I, I, I'm optimistic and, and I like the way their schedule sets up to kind of ease into the Carolina matchup. Uh, with a couple games under their belt, as opposed to Virginia Tech, who's uh, right. hitting them right out of the gate. Yeah, that, that the, the the schedule, but both for Virginia Tech and, and Virginia, they're they're both fascinating. Tech because of six of the first seven at home, four of the last five on the road, and then UVA, you know, opening with those two home games against William and Mary in, in, in Illinois. Need to win both those, but then that those next four, you go to Carolina, you're home against Wake, a, a team that beat you on the road a year ago, and then back to back roadies against Miami and Louisville, and Louisville where you have never won, and Miami where you're going for the third consecutive year because of the COVID glitch in, in the schedule. You know, that to, that four game stretch to me number one because it's three on the road and in the last five years Virginia has the worst road record in the conference so clearly if the Cavaliers are to contend they're going to need to win on the road and there's three biggins right out of the shoot 
Absolutely. For better or worse, with both UVA and Virginia Tech, uh, certainly by Halloween, <laughs> we're oh. going to we're gonna know, and, and probably earlier than that, we're going to yeah. know where these seasons are headed. And um, hopefully it, they're headed in a direction that holds our interest for uh, the next month and a half. But uh, certainly that remains to be seen. Now, David, you also spent some time at Old Dominion this week. I had the chance to speak with Ricky Ronnie during the offseason, just about the oddity of getting the job and then not getting to coach any games. Right. So, and, 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 you know, he had a fascinating take on it. And, you know, he said the fact that he's a first time head coach, he told me probably made it a little bit easier in a sense that he didn't have a rhythm and a plan and a, this is the way I always do it. So he wasn't thrown for a loop. It was all going to be new to him anyway. That being said, it has been an odd start to Ricky Ronnie's tenure. What did you take away from, from your time there uh, with the Monarchs program? Well, I, I went over there Monday for, for their preseason me- media gathering, uh, really to explore the, the Richmond connection on the team. Uh, two-pronged. Allie Jennings, a uh, transfer-wide receiver, from West Virginia, played with the Mountaineers for, for two years and is a graduate of Highland Springs High School, uh, has, has come in. And uh, Ricky Ronnie really believes that, that, that Jennings is going to play a big role in that offense. And one of the primary reasons that Jennings chose the Monarchs when he decided to transfer was Old Dominion's new tight ends coach, Fontel Mines, mm-hmm. who is a former UVA wideout, NFL wideout, and a Hermitage High graduate who played at Hermitage with Ali Jennings' brother and has known Ali since he was like five or six years old. And Mines came to the Monarch staff f- f- from East Carolina. He's coached previously at, at Richmond uh, and James Madison. And really interesting conversations with both Coach Mines and and Jennings. Uh, Enjoyed getting to speak with them about their shared Richmond roots and the connection that, that led Jennings to select Old Dominion. Yeah, that's that's quite the recruiting in, if you will, with, with that level of connection and and comfort, and uh, will be interesting to watch how this season unfolds for them and at ODU. And you know, speaking of the the Monarchs, I mean, it's twelve years ago, David. They were an FCS program. Five years ago, they played in their first bowl game. Three years ago, cover your ears, Hokies fans. They upset Virginia Tech, <laughs> and that progression brings us to this week's edition of Take It or Leave It. Thank you, Mike. In the next five years, Old Dominion will be playing football in the same conference as Virginia Tech and UVA. Take it or leave it. Let's start with Mike. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm so tempted to take it because <laughs> ODU's rise has been so precipitous. Uh, they have a decent market, if you will, in the Virginia Beach area. It, it's one of the reasons, and um, you know, JMU fans have always chafed at this, but that ODU was able to move up so quickly, whereas JMU is, is remained an FCS program. Um, but I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to leave it because of where we started the show w- with that alliance. I think we're moving closer to Virginia Tech, UVA being in the same conference uh, as Big Ten members, as uh, Pac-12 members. I, I think that super conference idea is closer in my mind than elevating people up. So um, while I'm not ruling out anything in the college football realignment landscape, I, this one I'm going to have to leave. All right, David. I'm ruling it out, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> there is, There are few things in life that shock me anymore at my advanced age, but this would... It it truly would, and that's that's no offense at uh, to, toward old, old Dominion. I've been going over there for for decades and know everyone in the administration and in the coaching ranks over there. But uh, they, they are not going to be in the Power Five anytime soon. And truth be told, you know, I don't know that they even aspire to that. 
Certainly not within the next five years, because boy, that would be a rough, rough road. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I wonder too about tweaking the question. If we take the word football out, um, as the the football thing moves and, and and alliances are formed, as we're seeing, I've wondered, hey, aren't we going to get more regional conferences for the other <laughs> sports? Um, I think to me, there there's more of an opportunity there for ODU yes. to be playing its Olympic sports in the same conference as Virginia Tech and UVA, possibly James Madison. Interesting there, though, I think, you know, you look at ODU baseball and, and every school has a program or two like, but th- there's some work with facilities, um, oh, yeah. with budget that would need to be done. But yeah, I, I think you're right. that, And I think if you take the word football out, yeah, I could envision a scenario where ODU, Tech, UVA, uh, JMU, Liberty, you know, we get some kind of a regional conference, but I don't think football is going to be a part of part of that. No, sir. Well, thanks for listening. You can subscribe to Teal and Barber on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your podcasts. And please consider supporting local journalism with an online subscription to the TD. You can find special promotional offers available at richmond.com, including one where you pay a dollar and it will carry you all the way through football season. Today's show was produced by Dean Hoffmeyer. Teal and Barber is a podcast of the Richmond Times-Dispatch and richmond.com. For David Teal, I'm Mike Barber. Thanks for listening. Be healthy and safe and please... Join David and me again next time.